afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Uh, like a dutiful flight attendant, uh, perhaps before we, or as we begin, I ought to offer a clarification, just in case anyone has gotten on the wrong plane. Um, but John Conley, who will be speaking here today and whose wonderful career we are celebrating, I think we need to remind those who don't know, it was not the John Conley, the erstwhile mayoral candidate in Boston in 2013. <laughs> <laughs> Despite the title here, he neither is he John Conley, the former FBI agent who ah. had a rather shady <laughs> relation with that uh, in notorious uh, South Boston mobster and murderer <laughs> fighting at Baltimore. And although John, uh, many of us do remember the times when you used to compare the cost of going to Smith to the cost of keeping a criminal in, in, in prison. In prison, right. <laughs> <laughs> I think we used to be better now. We're, we're Our John Connolly, whose appointment to the Sophia Smith Professor of Philosophy, we mark on this occasion, is Bronx born and bred. Seemed important to say that to you, Boston uh, Red Sox faithful, and the really, really, really faithful, uh, that John is not never was and never will be a Yankees fan. <laughs> John remained, however, in the Bronx to take an undergraduate degree at Fordham before heading off to Oxford for an MA and then completing his formal training in philosophy with a PhD from Harvard. He joined the philosophy department here at Smith in 1973. John had a keen sense even then of the crabbedness, perhaps crabbiness, of highly controlled disciplinary boundaries. A prominent example was John's forceful argument years before uh, any of us now, his immediate colleagues in philosophy, were here, that the department mount a course in feminist philosophy to mark the 100th year anniversary of Smith's opening in 1875. John was an early and ardent fan, fan and instigator of courses that underscored Western philosophy's rich and complicated relation to larger intellectual, social, and political context. Hence, for example, the interdisciplinary A History of Western Ideas, which he co-designed and co-taught in the, in the late 80s, and for which he wrote four one-act plays. I don't know if we're going to get any of those today. <laughs> John maintains a, heart, uh, it maintains a hearty uh, uh, support for courses based on the assumption that philosophical inquiry sometimes can and should bear on matters of contemporary concern and consequence. Uh, for example, uh, John introduced a course on business ethics. He assures us that this term is not an oxymoron, which he taught from 2005 <laughs> to 2011. And uh, we hear, at least the rumors are, that the many economics majors that went through this class didn't even bat an eye. No. <laughs> Uh, it seemed important to take time to highlight a few of John's inspired and far-reaching contributions to the departments and the college's curriculum because they may be obscured somewhat in past celebrations of John's extraordinary tour of duty in College Hall and in this evening's uh, setting of his scholarly life. In fact, against the background uh, of the years, uh, not to mention the pound of flesh that John gave to the college as an administrator, his achievements as teacher and scholar stand out especially brightly. Many, perhaps most in the audience, are familiar with the historic John Connolly Trail in College Hall. There's a little guide for it. It kind of traces his, uh, his life there. He was um, dean for curriculum and faculty development from 1992 to 1994. Dean of the faculty from 1994 to 2001, and it was during uh, that time that that position was put on uh, provostial steroids, and so John ended up as the first provost of Smith College. And then John was acting president during the tumultuous and terrifying year of 2001-2002, a time of especially great fear and uncertainty, John was quick to remind us, for those students, colleagues, neighbors, and visitors, subject to heightened scrutiny, suspicion, and the quicksilver of cheap hatred. So we turn now, though, meanwhile, and to turn to this official reason for uh, John's being here. I'm sorry. He took my space. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> if that were all that John had done uh, 
for his students, for his colleagues, for the college, it surely would have been enough. In fact, much more than enough. But John returned to the department, willingly, indeed eagerly picking up where he had left off, chairing once again, teaching with gusto the required uh, uh, colloquium for majors uh, for which he had been the main designer, adding the course in business ethics as well as one on the history of medieval philosophy, and offering the only course in the valley on Wittgenstein, uh, especially during the years uh, 2007 to 2010 when he was the five college 40th year anniversary professor in philosophy. John also uh, was very, very creative uh, and innovative in forging connections between uh, our department and the Alumni Association in co-sponsoring panels on ethical problems in the worlds of medicine, journalism, business, engineering. During my terms as chair of the philosophy department, and I'm sure other chairs have felt this too, nothing matched the pleasure of learning from the Office of the Dean for, for Academic Development that a member of the department was among the very small number of instructors earning highest marks on student evaluations. During his last semester teaching, the spring of 2012, John received such marks for both his courses. I mean, what a breathtaking way to take leave of the classroom. So, meanwhile, as I was saying, and to return to the official reason, or the main reason anyway, for our being together this afternoon, uh, even while refining his skills in cat herding as dean of faculty, <laughs> John continued to publish in scholarly journals and to give talks to a wide variety of audiences about his research, about Smith, about the state of higher education. Since returning to civilian life, John has had a chance to spend more quality time with his partner in crime, Meister Eckhart. And even as we speak, the monks and the elves of Oxford University Press are putting into print uh, John's forthcoming book. It's be out in just a few months, right? Living Without Why, Meister Eckhart's critique of the medieval concept of will. Perhaps we'll have a chance today to learn from John about the relation, or lack thereof, between this work on Meister Eckhart and John's earlier published works on topics <laughs> such as action theory and interpretation, and on figures such as Martin Luther, Adam Smith, David Hume, Gottlob Frege, and Hans-Jörg Gadamer. John's talk today, CSI Garden of Eden, Meister Eckhart on the Primal Crime, marks his appointment as the Sophia Smith Professor of Philosophy. The Sophia Smith Professor of Philosophy. John Connolly, Sophia Smith. It's hard to imagine a finer way to take note of their shared importance to Smith College. And if you listen closely, you can hear that excellent woman turning cartwheels in her subterranean lake. <laughs> <laughs> so bravo, Professor John Connolly. Bravo, and thank you. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you all. <coughs> Thank you, Vicky, for that more than, more than gracious introduction. It's very lovely. Uh, can you hear me, everyone? Yep. Good. Then I'll maybe not use the microphone, uh, but do let me know if, uh, if I, uh, my voice starts to fade. Um, and thank you all for coming today. It's a great pleasure to see you here. Um, I was notified by Carol Christ of my appointment as a Sophia Smith professor in July of 2011. Uh, but for a variety of reasons, I was unable to schedule my talk until today. Um, since I'm retiring in June, this event will have an inevitable ave atque vale uh, <laughs> character to it. I'm happy to dedicate the lecture both to Carol and to our deceased colleague Paul Alpers, who was uh, an important intellectual presence on our campus for 11 years and who shared with me an interest in the topic of this talk today. I'm grateful to both him and to Carol. And I'm also delighted that my talk can be part of the inaugural year festivities for our dynamic new president, uh, Kathleen McCartney. So let's see if this will work now. 
I propose to speak this evening about a theme that we academics might regard as outmoded. Um, who today is still interested in the story of Adam, Eve, and the primal sin or crime? It's a good question. Now, one way to gauge uh, contemporary interest in a subject is to look for representations of it in the popular culture. For example, in uh, references in, in magazines or artistic uh, representations and the like. Here are a few pertaining to my theme. Uh, these are life-size statues of Adam and Eve on the campus of uh, Indiana University in Bloomington, uh, statues by Jean Paul Dario. Um, these are the artistically <laughs> quite different 12-foot high statues of the primal pair by the acclaimed architect Fernando Botero. And these are in the Time Warner Center in Manhattan. Their very bulk suggests something of their enduring presence in our culture. Uh, there are Smith connections uh, to this story as well. For instance, this is the Paradise Fountain uh, in Hamburg by Bernd Altenstein uh, in the Rotenbaum Chaussee, just about 100 meters from the Smith JYA headquarters. It represents various parts of the, uh, of the story. Here is Eve is being born out of the side of Adam here. Here are her knees and head and so on. Various other parts are on other sides of the statue. And closer to home, uh, this is, of course, our own local piece of the Eden legend, uh, Paradise Pond. <laughs> now, if you have lingering doubts about the persistence and pervasiveness of the story, you can visit the Google search engine. If one types Adam and Eve uh, on the search line, as I did recently, one gets an astonishing result. 190 million hits. Um, uh, now, that is really an amazing number. Um, and it bespeaks a considerable interest in, West, in what is, after all, the foundational myth of Western culture. Uh, 190 million websites, just to make it a little more plastic for us, uh, are far more than, than even 20 people working together as a team could cover in a normal lifetime, even if they spent full time at it giving one minute to each website. <laughs> Adam and Eve are everywhere. Um, what accounts, though, for their continuing popularity? Uh, one reason is surely their crucial position, according to three of the world's great religions, at the beginning of human history. Beyond that, they are, uh, for all the magical elements in the story, truly fully human. Um, and their story is replete with the great themes, uh, the unity of the human family. We all come from that one couple. Um, our privileged pay, uh, place among terrestrial beings, uh, the loss of our original innocence, um, the connection of that loss to nakedness and sex, the knowledge of good and evil, um, but also our ingrained inclination to shift the blame to someone else, um, uh, our Faustian desire for knowledge at all costs, and the divine punishment for such overreaching and so on. But is there actually agreement among the various crime scene investigators? CSI, by the way, for those who are not familiar with American television, means crime scene investigation. Um, and we can think of the various interpreters of the story as crime scene investigators. Is there agreement among them about what actually happened in the garden? Um, there are many puzzling elements in it. For example, how did there come to be a talking serpent in Eden? And why did it want to tempt Eve to transgress? And why such apparently draconian punishments for what seems a relatively minor offense? And so on. Which leads to my question today. Um, was there a crime in Eden? Um, and if there was certainly a transgression of some sort, was it nonetheless a felony? Or perhaps a misdemeanor? Or even more mildly, perhaps just an accident? Um, I would like to suggest that a very familiar understanding of the Adam and Eve story, according to which a cosmic crime was committed, should not be taken as natural or the norm. 
Um, I will argue that this familiar understanding does not come from the biblical text itself in the book of Genesis, um, but rather comes to us in the West via a detour, namely uh, through a highly influential interpretation of the story by St. Augustine in the fifth century. But even within the Western world, leaving aside Judaism and Islam, there have been quite different ways of reading that tale, both before and after Augustine, ways that are much less familiar to us, and though they, they too are um, worthy of consideration. So here is an outline um, of my talk. Um, First, we'll look at the main elements of the Genesis story. Um, then, St. Augustine's interpretation in the fifth century and how it contrasts briefly with the, an earlier reading by Origen in the third century. Um, Meister Eckhart's reinterpretation in the 14th century in the High Middle Ages. Um, Eckhart's debt to Moses Maimonides. And finally, the upshot. Uh, we'll try to figure out what crime actually took place. I've chosen these thinkers, Augustine, uh, Origen, and Maimonides, because for Eckhart, each of them is crucial in a way, either as an inspiration or as an opponent in the case of Augustine for our question of the so-called crimes in Eden. So let me begin by asking for your help. We're told that a crime took place. Um, what are the main elements in the crime story that are found directly in the text. Help me out here. <laughs> you all know the tale. What happened? The apple. The apple, yes. And what, what happened to that apple, Mary Dunn? Eve <laughs> Okay. There we go. Eve took the forbidden fruit from the serpent and ate it. Um, Genesis 3, 6, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. Um, next to the, to the text in this slide is an image of the seductress Eve taken from a perfume ad for Fleur de Figuier um, that was to be seen in pharmacies last year in Germany. So what else do we know now from the text of Genesis? What else happened? Eve, Eve ate the fruit. Is that the end of the story? Guilty. <laughs> Somebody else got into the act, too, right? Yes, Albert. Uh, didn't she convince uh, Adam to eat it? She didn't have to do much. She handed, according to the text, she handed it to Adam, and he, too, ate it, okay, without, without so much as a, a whimper. So she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. This is perhaps the most famous transaction between a woman and a man in all of human history. Here we see it in the famous representation of Lucas Cranach from 1533. Um, there is a slight anachronism here in that according to Genesis, the pair did not cover themselves with leaves of any kind until after Adam had eaten of the fruit. So he took a bite. What happened next? Shame, yes. The, this is very interesting. They made fig leaf coverings for their nakedness because, according to the text, they became aware for the first time that they were naked. And they covered themselves with fig leaves. So that's very, that's very important. And then what? They heard something. What, ha what did they hear? The voice of God. They heard the voice of God. Mary Dunn is very well up on this story. <laughs> that's wonderful. <laughs> very good. She, absolutely right. They heard the voice of God. <laughs> and were afraid. Here they are running for cover in this representation by Marc Chagall. Um, okay, so when God finds them, what did he say to them? What was going to happen to them now? Okay, so um, there was going to be banishment. And in addition to banishment from this wonderful place of Eden, there were going to be a variety of punishments as well. Do you recall what some of those were? Childbirth was going to hurt. Sorry? <laughs> what? 
Childbirth was going to hurt. Yes, childbirth was going to hurt, but worse than that even. Men were going to work. <laughs> this is true too. They were going to have to work. Adam was going to have to work very hard and Eve too. But worse, they were going to die. Were going to die. Yes, so they were going to die, right? I think we can agree that's worse than working. Um, <laughs> Adam would have to work hard and Eve would bear her children in pain and perhaps just as bad, she would have to be subservient to her husband which is, of course, the main reason why we need places like Smith College, right? <laughs> so these are all of the, almost all, of the main elements that are to be found uh, directly in the text. Um, here is the expelled couple looking rather glum uh, outside of Eden. Um, the depiction is a mosaic in the Norman Cathedral of Monreale of the island, on the island of Sicily. Um, but there is one interesting element that hasn't been mentioned yet and rarely gets much attention actually from artists and commentators and what have you of one sort or another. The serpent. No, the serpent, we ha we, remember she took the fruit from the serpent. No, this is, this is an interesting uh, little twist to the story. Uh, Genesis 3.21 tells us that God made clothing of skins for Adam and Eve and clothed them in it. Um, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Now this charming aspect of the tale uh, has received remarkably little attention from artists over the centuries. Cent centuries. I did manage to track down one image with the help of Carl Donfried, it is by the 13th century English illustrator William de Brailles. Um, and I think, it's, I think it's from a manuscript. Um, in any case, um, just why this particular aspect of the story has been ignored uh, is, something, is something of a mystery, but I will make a suggestion as to why that might be the case later. Um, now if we look, for instance, at this famous sequential painting by Cranach, um, we see various elements of the story, the birth or the, the creation of Adam out of clay over here, and of Eve out of Adam's side, um, the eating of the fruit here, the couple hiding themselves over here and hearing the verse, voice of God up in the cloud, uh, God's instruction of them very prominently here in foreground, and then their banishment from uh, the garden. But no, um, no making of clothing for them by the Lord. And in fact, they're being driven out. You see they're not even wearing any clothes. They're not even wearing their fig leaves. Um, <laughs> further, we should also note, before leaving the story behind for a moment, um, that there is no mention in the Genesis text itself of sin much less original sin, and no explicit claim that God was angry with the couple. Okay, so now we will turn next to St. Augustine's interpretation of the tale in the fifth century. Um, this is Augustine with one of his favorite characters, the devil, um, in a uh, painting, famous painting by Michel Pacha from the 15th century. Uh, second to none, Augustine was a, an incredibly clear-eyed and unsentimental observer of human egotism, selfishness, and hypocrisy, uh, not least his own. He was convinced that without God's grace, um, we are pitiable and ruthless creatures, uh, exploiting one another at every turn. As a bishop in the North African part of the late Roman Empire in the West during an especially violent phase of the Germanic invasions, um, he had ample opportunity to have his deep pessimism about human nature confirmed. And he became the prime prosecutor of the primal parents, accusing Adam and Eve of the greatest crime in all of history. Historically, this take on the story was something of a novelty. Many earlier interpreters had gone rather more easy on the first couple. 
Take, for instance, the very influential third century uh, Greek church father or Greek speaking church father from Alexandria, uh, Origen, from the uh, third century. Although he was, like Augustine, a Platonist, philosophically speaking, for Origen, this inspiration led to quite different outcomes. For one thing, he was more strongly convinced than Augustine that the fundamentally correct way to read the Bible is allegorically. Um, since the depth of divine revelation uh, must lie deep beneath the surface and is in a certain sense uh, unplumbable. For example, he puts this approach to work in his reading of the text I just mentioned, namely Genesis 3.21, um, about the making of the clothing out of skins. Origen gives a striking reading to this text, one that would readily uh, suggest itself on reflection to a Platonist. Up until the fall in the garden, according to Origen, our first parents had entirely spiritual uh, were entirely spiritual creatures. That is, they had no material body at all. In ancient philosophy, and especially in Plato, the body is sometimes called the cloak or coat of the soul, an image that Origen connects to the biblical report of God as the divine cloakmaker. An important point here is that if Origen is right, the primal sin cannot have had anything to do with bodily desires, with sex or the desire for a tasty mortal at all. But if not, what did it have to do with? Put differently, since only creatures with bodies can die, how did death come into the world? Origen's answer is significant. Death did not come into the world as a punishment in the ordinary sense, for God was not angry with Adam and Eve for their disobedience. He did not punish them. Origen understands the banishment from Eden and the other painful consequences as the natural results of a mistaken choice. God did not invent death, nor did he impose it upon Adam and Eve as some sort of retribution. Rather, they brought it upon themselves, and here are Origen's own words, Adam adopted the serpent's ways of thought, loving some people as good and hating others as bad. That is the tree of the knowledge of good. Whoever tastes of its fruit will die, whereby it is not God who brings about the death, but rather the person who has regarded his neighbor with hatred. For go and this is now a quote from the Book of Wisdom. For God did not make death, and he takes no pleasure in the destruction of the living. Nor is he moved, says Origen, by the passion of anger. <coughs> For Westerners raised on a diet of St. Augustine, these are surprising claims. Adam and Eve, according to Origen, were originally some sort of spirits, like angels. And in this original condition, they had nothing to do with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, nor was this knowledge which Origen calls the serpent's ways of thought, altogether desirable, since it involves hatred. Further, God was not angry at Adam and Eve, indeed cannot be angry. The catastrophic consequences of their eating of the fruit uh, were not punishments, but a kind of logical consequence of the choice made by the primal parents to walk a different path, the path of the body and thus of moral judgments and, yes, of hatred. It is hardly surprising that uh, the views of Origen were controversial even in the early church. Some of them were condemned as heretical, which was tragic since it led to the burning and thus disappearance of many of his writings. In any event, his allegorical reading of the story, with its downplaying of the criminal charges, against Adam and Eve, lost influence in the Latin-speaking West of Christendom uh, with the rise of St. Augustine uh, at the beginning, around the beginning of the fifth century. So from Augustine's reading of Genesis, the text of Genesis, come some of the elements of the story most familiar to Christians in the West, 
especially, for example, that Adam and Eve were human beings just like us, except that prior to the fall, they were highly gifted with God's grace and had a completely free will. Nonetheless, they sinned catastrophically, the origin of evil in the world. I highlight this point and we'll return to it in a moment. Augustine further taught that God was rightly enraged at Adam and Eve, um, that corresponding to their primal sin, there is an original sin in each of their descendants. We all are born corrupted. We are all born sinful, not merely sinfully inclined, but actually sinful, uh, according to Augustine. Um, and this has a host of unpleasant and destructive consequences for us. Namely, this deeply rooted inclination towards sin. Um, our intellect is much dimmed from what it originally was. Um, we now have an unfree will, that is, we cannot but sin, and thus no possibility of pleasing God without the gift of grace. Um, and thus we sin constantly and, strictly speaking, deserve eternal punishment in hell. It was only through the suffering and death of Jesus Christ that the debt incurred by Adam and Eve is paid um, so that some few human beings can be saved from this horrible fate. This is Augustine's doctrine of original sin. Now, this doctrine is the most novel and consequential aspect of Augustine's reading of Genesis. According to it, as I said, we are all born corrupt. Um, even newborns demonstrate a sinful bent by their sometimes uncontrollable crying and by greedily sucking at the breast, he said. It was for Augustine of the greatest importance as a, as a, a sort of lifelong project to explain how evil had come into the world. If God is all good and all powerful, um, how could the world come to, create, come to contain rather genuine evil, and especially moral evil? After decades of struggle with this question, um, Augustine came to an answer that finally satisfied him. Evil came into the world through the sin of Adam and Eve. Although God created them very good, for some inexplicable reason they became swollen with pride and sinned. Um, there's nothing said directly in the text about them becoming swollen with pride or what have you. This is a reading by Augustine. They could do so, they could sin in spite of their being made very good because they had freedom of will. Um, they could either choose to remain just and sinless or they could decide to follow, um, they could decide to uh, follow another course even though it was forbidden as they well knew. Enter the serpent with its diabolical mission and for reasons obscure Eve and then Adam let themselves in their pride be hoodwinked. The results were catastrophic beginning with God's uh, angry expulsion of the couple from Eden and the host of punishments that we've just talked about, including, according to Augustine, the infection of all their descendants with original sin and the condemnation of most of us to eternal torment. And while we are on earth, we have to endure the myriad sufferings of human life. Yep. This is indeed a grim picture, um, but at some point one wants to ask what led Augustine to add elements to the biblical story? Because a lot of what I've just said is not actually in Genesis. Um, in particular, what led him to the idea of inherited or original sin? Um, there's nothing in Genesis about the human race being condemned, for the most part, to hell. Um, Augustine's interpretation has enormous consequences. For example, it makes God seem uh, incomprehensibly cruel in the eyes of many people. Um, so that Augustine is driven to claiming that we, with our weak intellects, 
are simply not capable of grasping the justice of sending to hell the bulk of humanity, which, he admits, is born unable not to sin. But if God can act in such an autocratic and violent way, this would seem to justify the same sort of behavior uh, by humans towards one another. So where does Augustine and some other early Christian writers too, though none so comprehensively and influentially as he, where does he get this notion of inherited or original sin, which as I say is not present in the original text describing the crime scene? It seems to me the notion is largely an inference or hypothesis designed to explain a particular understanding of the suffering and death of Jesus. Augustine looks at this in economic terms. Okay. If the salvation of even a relative handful of human beings, uh, <coughs> Adam and Eve's descendants, required the horrific crucifixion and death on the cross of the sinless Jesus, then the original guilt must have been enormous. Um, and furthermore, it must have been passed along to all of humanity after Eden. In other words, Augustine can make sense of the suffering and death of Jesus only if he posits a terrible primal sin in Eden, which infects all of subsequent humanity. So it's that under, his understanding of salvation, of this huge payment that was demanded by God, um, and infers from that that the crime that was being made up for must have been monumental, cosmic in scope. Augustine was spectacularly successful with his interpretation. His approach, which in its sweep, in its, uh, sweep and harshness was quite new in uh, Christian thought and unparalleled in Judaism and Islam, at first called forth bitter opposition. Um, but it eventually prevailed in Western Christendom about a century after his death. It became a firm cornerstone of both Catholic and Protestant theology, since the Protestant reformers wanted to be even more Augustinian than Augustine. <laughs> so now we have covered the first two main topics in the uh, lecture, the story and Augustine's reinterpretation with a little background about origin. Now we can proceed to um, Meister Eckhart in the 14th century. Um, in many ways, Eckhart's reading more closely resembles that of Origen than that of Augustine, for the influence of Origen had never died out entirely in the West, and in fact, in the High Middle Ages, it began to grow stronger again. Indeed, Eckhart's most famous metaphor, the birth of God's son in the soul, uh, was first coined by Origen. Here is Eckhart at work in a, an imagined representation by our Mount Holyoke colleague, uh, Marion Bonnie Miller, my favorite portrait painter. Meister Eckhart of Hochheim was born in central Germany around 1260. As an adolescent, he entered the still young Dominican order in the city of Erfurt, and he continued his training in Cologne, where he was likely uh, a pupil of the famous Albert the Great. Um, he went on to study philosophy and theology at the leading European university in Paris. After a brilliant career as what Heidegger referred to as a Leser und Lebermeister, roughly a renowned professor and a wise preacher, he wound up suffering the same fate as Origen when he was called before the Inquisition and a number of his teachings were posthumously condemned by the Pope as heretical. Eckhart is generally known as a mystic. Um, what that means in Eckhart's case is not a matter of mystical experiences. He doesn't have anything to say about them. Instead, on philosophical grounds, Eckhart aims to convince his readers that they have and should become aware of an unmediated connection to God. God is literally in us. The basis of that connection is the human intellect. 
understood in the sense of the Aristotelian tradition as the mental faculty by which we understand the highest and most abstract truths of metaphysics and logic, the eternal verity, so to speak. That we have such a faculty uh, explains, he thinks, the assertion in Genesis that mankind was made <coughs> in God's image. For, he argues, God is intellect, and the divine intellect is itself above being and is the source of being. As a result, all things that have intellect, um, in that Aristotelian sense, including us humans, are able to unite, literally, to become one with the divine intellect. In our case, that calls for first a detachment from our, um, all of our peculiarities, a gentle letting go of them, the things that, di that distinguish us from one another. And second, an identification with what is common to us all, namely the intellect that we also share with God. Now, if you take this notion of detachment, so central to Eckhart's moral philosophy, and then substitute the concept of the Buddha mind or Buddha nature for God in Eckhart's program, you can see why many Buddhist thinkers have felt a kindred spirit in Eckhart. There are literally tens of thousands of, we of websites on Eckhart and Buddhism. Eckhartian detachment is not about becoming hermits or withdrawing from the world. He himself was a busy scholar and a leading administrator of his Dominican order, a task that involved incredible amounts of travel, most of it on foot. Um, but we can adopt an attitude of detachment towards ourselves and our projects that enables us, he would say, um, to appreciate what is truly important, uh, namely the rational nature that unites us to one another and with God. At times, Eckhart sounds very like Immanuel Kant, the great German 18th century philosopher. For example, when both say in, that in principle we should love and care about all human beings equally, and not only those near and dear to us. One of the striking consequences of Eckhart's views, which I've only barely managed to outline here, is his counsel to live without why. That is, to do the right thing for its own sake and not to be rewarded for it by other people or by God. His ideal person, Eckhart calls the just one. And of her, he says that she is so devoted to justice that if God were not just, she would not care a bean about God. Now, Eckhart is teaching this in the years between 1300 and uh, 1327. Just a few decades earlier, Thomas Aquinas, also a Dominican, um, who would later become the official theologian of the Catholic Church, had developed a monumental moral system in which the correct motivation for action is thought of as the desire for that complete happiness that can only be achieved as a divine reward in heaven via the beatific vision. Hence, we should arrange our lives in such a way so as to make that ultimate reward possible. Why do we act the way we do? Ideally, in order to attain heaven. Eckhart's approach amounts to a rejection of this view. We are here, let me first, let me actually show you a little schematic of that. So, this would be the, the view worked out by Augustine and Thomas Aquinas, roughly. The will, the human will, is by its nature oriented towards happiness. In fact, they argue, happiness consists in the beatific vision of God in heaven. So good deeds become a means to this goal. That is, they are the reward of the just. Eckhart rejects this approach to the moral <laughs> life. For him, we are here and now already one with God through our intellectual nature, whether or not we realize it. Our task in life is to come to this realization and to act accordingly, for example, justly, wisely, lovingly. Um, acting in this way is what Eckhart means by the birth of God's Son in the soul. 
And that is in the soul, of course, of the detached person, because the only way to that is to let go of our particular uh, and private, so to speak, interests or concerns. By contrast, to act in order to gain some reward, that is to act with a why, is to act like a servant, he says, or a merchant, interestingly, <laughs> either hoping to please a superior or to strike a bargain with God, a quid pro quo. This is behavior not worthy of the just one, the free person who is one with God. So, I just recently, as Vicki mentioned, completed a book on this topic about the relation of the will and happiness and what Eckhart might mean by living without why. Um, as I say, the biggest names in medieval philosophy, Augustine and Aquinas, um, in a sense, uh, argue for living with a why. Every act we perform should have that goal. Um, Eckhart thought that was not the right way. We should live without this kind of will. Truly good deeds are the expression of correct detachment, that is, of the birth of God's Son in the soul. The mistaken advice, according to Eckhart, of um, Aquinas and Augustine is based on a faulty analysis of the relationship between God and human beings. Through the intellect, we are already one with the divine nature. By detachment from our particular and non-essential aspects, we can align ourselves with the shared divine nature so that our behavior becomes that expression of that nature. Now, how does all of this relate to Adam, Eve, and the primal sin? Well, one way to think about Adam and Eve before the fall is that they were the sorts of human beings we were meant to be, ideally. So were they without will in the sense of the pursuit of that ultimate goal on Eckhart's view? The answer turns out to be yes. Um, Eckhart wrote not one but two commentaries on Genesis, and he gives us an interpretation of the story of the fall. Um, like Origen, Eckhart is inclined to read the story allegorically rather than literally. He is less interested in an account of what happened in the past than in what the Bible can tell us its readers about ourselves. So for him, Adam and Eve are more like ideal types representing human nature. What looks in the Genesis story like a simple narrative of our primal parents becomes in Eckhart's hands a sophisticated part of his overall analysis um, of the situation of Adam and Eve and by implication of human beings more broadly. Let's turn to that next. Eckhart's principal commentary on the fall of Adam and Eve is focused on Genesis 3.7. As soon as the two ate the fruit, the Bible says, their eyes were opened. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. And they sew the fig leaves together. Eckhart begins his interpretation in an unusual fashion. That is, with a long citation, not from Augustine or Thomas Aquinas, not even from Origen, but from the learned medieval Jewish philosopher and sage Moses Maimonides, who commented on this same verse. Here is a statue of him in uh, Cordoba, Spain, where he was born in 1135. The statue happens to stand practically next door to the Preshko Junior Year in Spain program in which Smith plays the leading role. Maimonides wanted to uh, explain an apparent peculiarity for well, the Genesis text makes it sound as if when Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, they were, in a sense, rewarded with new knowledge, the precious knowledge of good and evil. Maimonides makes it clear that although they did gain a new kind of knowledge, in the process they lost something more precious, indeed the most precious. He writes, as quoted by Eckhart, 
The intellect, which was granted to man as his highest endowment, was bestowed on him before his disobedience. With reference to this gift, the Bible states that man was created in the form and likeness of God. Through the intellect, God spoke with Adam and Eve. Right away we should notice that Maimonides, as a Neoplatonist like Eckhart, puts his primary focus on the intellect, the higher mind, as the highest human perfection, and not, say, on freedom of the will. Maimonides continues, and I apologize for the amount of text uh, on these next few slides, but the text is crucial. Through the intellect, we distinguish between the true and the false. This faculty Adam possessed perfectly uh, and completely before the fall. But the right and wrong are terms employed in the science of apparent truths, of morals or ethics, not in that of necessary truths. In the state of innocence, Adam was guided solely by reflection and reason, on account of which it is said, thou hast made mankind little lower than the angels. Now, in this paragraph, Maimonides is making use of a crucial distinction of cognitive faculties that goes back at least to Aristotle. On the one hand, there is the intellect, um, with which, uh, sorry, which we use to grasp abstract, necessary truths. For example, one that Aristotle was fond of was uh, the truth that the universe could not have had a beginning. Um, on the other hand, we have the faculty of lower reason, with which we grasp and think about certain matters. For example, morals, which involve sense perception. Maimonides gives an example of Adam's ignorance of moral matters prior to the fall. In that state, Adam could not follow or understand the principles of morals. A most manifest impropriety, that is, to appear in a state of nudity, was not unbecoming to his eyes. <laughs> Why were they not ashamed of their nakedness? Presumably because in their state of intellectual contemplation, with the eternal verities before them, <coughs> they were unaware of their bodies. Or perhaps they had no bodies, as Origen uh, had suggested nearly a thousand years earlier. Maimonides completes his interpretation of Genesis 3-7 with this comment. After Adam's disobedience, however, when he began to give way to desires which had their source in his imagination and to the gratification of his body's appetite, bodily appetites, he was punished by the loss of part of that intellectual faculty which he had previously possessed. He therefore transgressed a command with which he had been charged on the score of his reason. And having obtained a knowledge of, of apparent truths, he was wholly absorbed uh, in the study of what is proper and improper. So the fall is seen as involving the loss of our highest ability, um, which is thought of as the capacity to live in the realm of the intellect. Instead, Adam and Eve descended, so to speak, into the realm of the imagination, the senses, and the body. Now, Eckhart comments on what Maimonides wrote. To sum up, Rabbi Moses thus wants to say that before the fall, human <coughs> beings lived in the realm of the intellect and neither did they turn toward things of the senses, nor were they affected by them. The former realm is one of truth, but not properly of moral goodness. Good and evil are in the latter realm. These pertain to appetite and desire, which are only secondarily rational and were fully subject to the essentially rational faculty before the fall. That is, there was the correct order in them, in Adam and Eve, of which it was written, uh, written, God made human beings aright, um, Ecclesiastes 7.30. Okay, so this correct order is where the intellect, the higher intellect, oriented to the eternal verities, is in charge. And where our secondary rational uh, abilities, concerned with the empirical day-to-day -day matters and the maintenance of our bodies, are subject to the intellect. And our non-rational faculties, our desires, emotions, and sensations, obey these superior faculties. This ideal division of the soul goes back to Plato and Aristotle. Now, what is remarkable here is this. Maimonides, and with him Eckhart, seem to imply that Adam and Eve before the fall had no knowledge of, nor any need for, moral reasoning. Furthermore, the implication is clearly that God, having made them aright, 
and having put the tree of the knowledge of moral matters off limits, did not want them to be concerned with moral matters at all. That such questions only arise when our desires become literally unruly and degenerate into, for example, lust, envy, greed, hatred, etc. The eating of the forbidden fruit symbolizes the transition from the original and correct order in our souls to the unruly conditions with which we are only too familiar. The original or ideal human beings must have been very different from us, perhaps beings of the kind origin imagined. In any case, the interpretation of the fall in Maimonides and Eckhart is in several points diametrically opposed to that of Augustine. If before the fall, Adam and Eve were not concerned with moral matters, it follows, astonishingly enough, that they were incapable of sin. Because a necessary condition of sinning is that the sinner must understand that what she is doing is wrong, which is, of course, a moral notion. But Adam and Eve did not have the concepts of right and wrong yet, as is shown, according to Maimonides, by the fact that they did not realize that there was anything wrong with running around without any clothes on. <laughs> so what are we to make of the notion of the fall in this case? Um, well, uh, just take it literally. Um, they didn't jump deliberately. They fell. They stumbled. They made a catastrophic error. I'm reading into Eckhart here. He doesn't say this. Um, uh, when Eckhart adopted from Maimonides the way, uh, this way of looking at the fall of Adam and Eve, we can only assume that Augustine, to be followed much later by Sophia Smith, Augustine turned over in his grave uh, in North Africa. But whether or not he did, on Eckhart's principles, Adam and Eve in their original condition clearly did not need or perhaps even have a will in the sense that we saw earlier. Um, that is the capacity by which we strive for what we have identified as the goal or ideal of life. Adam and Eve did not need to strive. They were already there. But alas, not irrevocably. For us, the task is to reestablish that ideal order of the soul that they once had. And the key to doing that, says Eckhart, is detachment. Eckhart does not comment on his distance from Augustine. It could be dangerous for a Christian thinker in the Middle Ages to differ openly with the great church father. Indeed, Eckhart explicitly claims that his reading is a version of that of Thomas Aquinas, and even that it draws on Augustine for uh, inspiration. This was at best a great exaggeration on Eckhart's part. <laughs> But surprisingly, the Inquisition, when Eckhart was on trial, did not bring up these differences. Um, surprising since Eckhart's position directly challenges a key claim by Augustine, explicitly endorsed by church councils, that is that the suffering and death of Jesus were necessary to pay the debt, the debt that was created by the enormous sin of Adam and Eve and passed along as original sin to the entire human race. There isn't a word of this sort in Eckhart. So time to wrap up uh, our investigation of the alleged crime scene in the Garden of Eden. First, Augustine, the prosecutor, um, as we saw, needed to account for the presence of evil in a world created by an all good and all powerful God. He found his account in the biblical story of Adam and Eve, the enormity of whose sin um, explains the misery of the human condition. And that sin is required in his account to further explain why Jesus, the most perfect, indeed divine human, had to suffer and die. So he asks the jury, and that is all of you, all of us, um, to find Adam and Eve guilty and condemn them to death. So he's demanding the death penalty. Eckhart, on the other hand, turns out to be a kind of defense attorney for the primal parents. Without explicitly saying so, he implies that they could not really have sinned, um, though they did make a mistake with enormous consequences. Um, not a sin, but a blunder. 
which must be repaired at its core, which is in our souls. Therefore, he wants probation and reform for humankind. Um, it is something we can repair. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil was, of course, for Eckhart and for all the others, off limits. To enter its realm was to stand on its head the original and ideal order of the human soul, and thus to disrupt the peaceable kingdom in Eden. The upshot has been the era of turbulence, war, murder, rape, tyranny, and patriarchy that we still live in as a kind of punishment for the fall, but a punishment in the sense of a logical consequence. And it will continue until we reestablish that original and correct order in the soul. When we do, the lion and the lamb can once again lie down together. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we, each of us, is a kind of jury member. And the question's an important one. How do we think about our human predicament? Uh, the three main Middle Eastern uh, religious traditions agree that there was a primal catastrophe. But was it a devastating sin, a crime, that can only be healed and perhaps only for a very few in a future life, if God grants us that? Or was it an error which can be set right in this life, albeit with much effort and, no doubt, divine help? If Eckhart is right, then something like this famous 19th century image by Edward Hicks is possible in this life, at least as a kind of allegory within the individual soul, the peaceable kingdom. And let me close with a close-up of this <laughs> lovely body of water in the background of he Hicks's Peaceable King. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'd be honored to take some questions. We have about 10 minutes or so. Yes, Sam. I'm wondering about entrapment. Yeah. Uh, so if we have creatures that aren't that, uh, mm -hmm. in the realm of the moral, yes. and there is a moral hazard placed there, yeah. they don't have, really have a shot at figuring out whether they're supposed to do it or not. Right. Um, so uh, maybe they're blameless, but is there any blame that gets transferred to God? Um, well, that's, a, that's a, of course, a deep uh, and difficult uh, question. I don't know. Uh, Eckhart certainly doesn't address it. I don't think Origen does either. But um, we could think of the, uh, of the story as, um, you know, told in retrospect, right? This is where we are, and things are not ideal. Um, maybe they once were, but from the vantage point of Eckhart, the, the reason to do that is to think of what we ought to become again. So it's less, again, a story, as I said in general about his reading of the Bible, less a story about what happened uh, and more a tale about our own souls and what we ought to or can hope for. So detach. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my Bill. Question. Can yeah. you talk about detachment in the context of that? Yes, uh, uh, Bill Hagen asks uh, if I can talk a little about detachment in the, um, my wife, my German wife, uh, has been after me to bring in the German term here. Uh, Eckhart uses this middle high German term called Abergescheidenheit, which is literally from uh, taking leave of something, saying farewell to it. Um, uh, and so that's, that is roughly the way he thinks of it. He has other terms too that he uses. Um, uh, some of them are, are very common and familiar uh, in meditation today, but uh, detachment, I think, is a, very, is a good translation of the Abergescheidenheit. He thinks of it in terms of letting go of our personal properties, both in the economic sense, where not to worry about one's belongings or what have you in life, but also in the sense of the things that distinguish me from others as ultimately of 
no importance. What is of ultimate importance is what we share, the human, human nature and uh, in particular the divine aspect of it through the intellect. Now, how do you get there? Well, there are a number of sermons where Eckhart talks about um, the importance of um, withdrawing into the temple. And he means this, uh, the temple is that highest part of the soul where God dwells. Um, he doesn't think we can stay there or ought to stay there. The point of uh, going into the temple is, um, so to speak, to remind ourselves of where the source of our motivation should come from. So he has this wonderful, um, this wonderful sermon, uh, Middle High German sermon, in which he, he says that um, the goal should be uh, for us to be virgins who are wives. A virgin, he says, is someone who is detached, who becomes empty, whose mind and so on, soul becomes empty in a certain way. But it's not enough to stay in that virginal state. Uh, it's important to become a wife that is fruitful. And that we do in our interactions with one another. Because when we identify with the divine nature, the divine nature is all just and all wise and all loving and so on. That's the way we ought to live. Um, and we do it because that's what we are rather than because we hope for some reward in the future. Right. Bill Orham. Uh, which poles, Bill? The temple? Yeah. Um, very good question. Uh, he, he says we mustn't think that these divine virtues that we can um, at times exemplify in our lives, we mustn't think of them as um, fixed uh, appropriations by ourselves in this life. Um, we're not capable of that. We're still embodied. We still have many distractions and ailments and what have you. Um, nonetheless, um, we ought to remind ourselves of it constantly. So you're right that it's, um, uh, it's as if we have to visit the temple once or twice a day or what have you and then, and then go forth and you know, deal with the various struggles of our day-to-day -day lives. Mary Dunn, yes. And, uh, Thank yeah. you for that wonderful lecture. <laughs> Thank you, Mary, yes. Uh, I wish you'd talk a little bit more about what Eckhart means by intellect. Yeah. Uh, I find uh, this whole theory of his tremendously attractive, yeah. having been raised in the Augustinian tradition myself. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm afraid that I probably attach a wholly modern meaning to the word intellect. Yeah. Well, the, the, modern, the modern sense is of, grows out of, we might say, this long tradition, but with many modifications along the way. As I say, this goes back to um, Aristotle, and in his thinking and also in that of, of Plato, there is, uh, they tend to see uh, intellect as comprised of two um, elements. First of all, there's a kind of intellectual intuition by which we grasp first principles, principles for which there's no proof. There cannot be a proof because any proof would presuppose them. So, for instance, the principle of non-contradiction is, is an example that's often, often given. Um, they also think, then, that the intellect involves the capacity to deduce other truths from these first principles. Okay. So basically then, intellect in this sense has to do with this realm of the necessary truths about, about the universe, about thought, and so on. And Aristotle wrote 12 long books of the metaphysics about, about them, uh, those truths. And <clears throat> this was you know, copiously commented on by the um, uh, the Arabic language philosophers and the Jewish philosophers. Maimonides was a, a keen Aristotelian in many ways. Um, and then, of course, by the Christian thinkers in the West starting in around, uh, tw around 1200 or so. Um, so 
that's, the, that's the notion that Eckhart has of intellect. An important feature of it for him is that um, Aristotle remarks in, this, um, in his book on the soul, when he's talking about the intellect, um, and he quotes Anaxagoras, an even earlier Greek thinker, that the intellect prior to forming a concept or, uh, or intellecting something is no real thing at all. The intellect has to be empty in order to be able to receive every concept, every form. Otherwise, certain things couldn't get in, so to speak. So the intellect has to have this essential emptiness to it. That's why Eckhart, who thinks that God is intellect, thinks also that God is above being. Because being is already a concept or a notion that is determined. So the intellect of God is this emptiness which gives rise to everything that is, uh, material and otherwise. Okay, and then, then of course there's the aspects of our mental capacity that deal with um, that deal with all sorts of things having to do with the world around us, perception, that, are, that becomes available to us through perception. And um, uh, that's often referred to as the, uh, you know, the lower intellect or, or what have you. And then they think of that as resting upon the Freudian id, <laughs> uh, namely our emotions and our desires and so on, which are at best subject to intellectual control or control by reason, but are not themselves rational per se, as we well know. Um, right. Jill Conway, yes. I'd, I'd love to know a little bit about how uh, these two great thinkers thought about animals and, yeah. and the creation. Yeah, that was a, a, very good, um, a very good question. I don't... Um, I don't think that Eckhart talks about <laughs> that aspect of uh, creation at all, and I can't think offhand of anything that Augustine says, although maybe Carl Donfried or someone else can, um, can help me out there. Um, the, a, as you probably know, I mean, animal creation um, is often taken as, uh, um, you know, an emblem or a symbol of the lower parts of ourselves. So the animals are ruled by their passions and their emotions and what have you. Um, and um, they're called brutes and what have you. Um, but that also renders them innocent, right? They, they don't, they can't sin. They're in a certain sense in that condition that Adam, Adam and Eve were at the start. Um, but it's not a peaceable kingdom that they live in either. Though it once was, we're told. So I'm sorry, I can't say more to it than that. Um, Dorothy, yes? Well, I also was raised in an Augustinian tradition. Yes. And I'm very glad to hear this alternative to it. <laughs> um, but it seems to me, in my upbringing, uh, the Augustinian theology came out of Paul. So it has yes. a oh, yes. Mm -hmm. foundation. Mm -hmm. So. Here's the, here's the trouble, yes, certainly. And the Protestant reformers um, certainly wanted to go back to Paul. Uh, the, the, there seems to be something like a wide agreement today, perhaps not universal, that Augustine misunderstood a key passage in Paul on which he based his notion of original sin. Uh, so he mistranslated, he, oh, uh, I'll have to, I'll have to, it's, it's in Romans. Uh, yeah. And uh, Carl may be able to, he reads the Latin term in quo in a way that it shouldn't be read. Um, so, but in any case, there's a lot, there's been a lot of ink spilled over that, um, <laughs> as you can imagine. Um, yes, Elliot. And then so, I was raised in a Jewish household. Yes. And our version of the story focused on the fruit. On yeah. The apple. Yes. So that the sin was eating from this apple knowledge. So that was the sin. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't have had that knowledge. Now does that A relate back to what you were saying about Eckhart and where the intellect was that this was superior and above yeah, this rotten fruit. <laughs> Leave it over there. <laughs> this is not um, this you don't need. 
that was the sort of, the sort of take, I guess. Uh, it's an allegory, of course, for saying that, look, OK, there are different, different paths you can go. And one stays here in this realm of the, of the intellect, with the angels, so to speak. And the other, um, well, here we are, trying it out. Um, I don't know if we made the right choice. Carol Zaleski. Yeah. Oh, Felix Culpa, the happy fault. fault. Yes, um, yes, yes, yes. Uh, that's one part of my question. The other is, is how he treats, um, this is a larger part in a way, the role of Jesus, the atonement, and the looking forward to resurrection yes. As, yes. as a kind of restoration right. beyond any we could think of in the present moment. Mm. Well, OK, uh, briefly, um, on the first one, I don't think he speaks to the Felix Culpa issue, although it's obviously um, to, to call the fall of Adam a happy fault um, is um, obviously open to various interpretations. But I don't, I'm not aware of any that he himself gives. Um, the second question is a very big one, because um, if we follow Eckhart out, you start to wonder whether this whole central notion, and I hinted at this in my talk, uh, of Augustine that this was a exculpatory, sacrificial death of Jesus on the cross is not necessary. Okay. So it, it does call, it, call those things into question. There's no, no doubt about that. And that, that, is, that is discussed in the Eckhart literature today. Um, there has been a, um, although the, uh, Eckhart's writings were condemned in 1329 or by and large, I mean, it was the idea was they shouldn't be read by anybody, um, according to the, uh, the Pope. And they were spirited away in various libraries uh, uh, during the middle, late Middle Ages um, and never quite, never really disappeared. They started to be noticed again during the period of German Romanticism, late 18th, early 19th century, Hegel and um, uh, various others were quite interested in, in Eckhart. And then an addition of his works was begun in the 19th century. In 1960, we had the 700th anniversary of his birth, at least the, the estimated year of his birth. And that has sparked a huge renaissance in Eckhart's scholarship. And they're just now completing, imagine 700 years after his birth, they're just now completing the official version of his works, which is a, a very uh, onerous and huge task. But it's coming to an end now. Um, uh, one, more one more question. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could address a point that um, I don't think you've brought up yet, but you've um, made this very tempting for me to ask. So Augustine's reading does a great job of explaining the suffering of Christ. Yep. What are we to make of that if we adopt Eckhart's reading? What does Eckhart have to say about that? Uh, um, again, this, this goes back to what uh, Carol was asking about. He does not talk about the death on the cross very much. Uh, it does not play a central part in his uh, theology, or in his, in his moral theology, for that matter. Um, uh, one of the things that we learn from Jesus on the cross is to sort of accept what comes. Uh, and uh, you know to bear bear with suffering if that's our lot, uh, but he doesn't he doesn't make it a central point in um, salvation history. I doubt that he would have denied that it had that role had it, had the question been put to him. But interestingly, the inquisitors never thought to raise it, or at least not that I can tell. They were much more concerned about him saying that God is in us. Um, that's what really worried them. And about, oh, a dozen or so of the 28 incriminated articles, uh, the heretical teachings, have to do with this business of living without a why. Um, and you might think that part of the, re I do anyway, part of the reason that they were upset about that was because it implies that you don't need a priest to pray for you. 